before the COVID pandemic upended the way the world does business, logistics was one of those industries that might have been taken for granted. That's not the case anymore. Due to all the turbulences over the last two years, customers are now realizing how important it is to have a reliable logistics partner on their side. Our people are doing a quite complex job. People think, oh, they just deliver parcels somewhere. That's an easy. If you think about what our people are doing, it's quite complex. Businesses and consumers are suddenly thinking a lot more about how things they need reach places where they're needed. It's thrust the sector into the spotlight. Logistics and supply chain has become a household name. Uh, it's uh, dramatically different than pre-pandemic. Yes, it's grown, whether that's in market cap, uh, revenue, profitability, investor interest. For Deutsche Post DHL Group, that's created opportunity to build on momentum and set ambitious goals for service and performance. When you look at our footprint, we're the most international logistics company there is. We want to become more digital and we want to be much more sustainable than we have been. DPDHL's revenue has soared since 2020, with full-year profit nearly doubling in 2021. CFO Melanie Kreis is a key leader of the team that's delivered these results, and she views her role as much more than just a number cruncher. There are unfortunately these cliches that finance is boring and it's kind of like bean counting in the back office to be successful in finance. I mean, you have to have um, the financial expertise, right? But we also have to be credible business leaders uh, in order to really impact the business and steer the direction. She is extremely smart and bright. You need somebody who is able to digest a lot of information very rapidly and can distinguish what is important, what is less important. And she has a tremendous skill in that. And she's not afraid to call people out, to call out other members of the executive team if she feels that something isn't being. She does that in a very nice way, actually. She helps me tremendously in steering the company because uh, she is highly regarded by my other colleagues in the senior team. and. Typically, if they have a problem, they share, share it first with her before they come to me. When I think about the conversations I have with Frank, the shortest part is actually about the analysis and the facts. Um, it's more the debate about, OK, on that basis, what are the options? What can we do? My role is essentially saying in three sentences, what is working well in this company? Uh, where do we have challenges? And what should we do going forward? Deutsche Post DHL Group consists of five divisions. Express, Germany's post and parcel service, global forwarding and freight, supply chain, and e-commerce solutions. Each of these segments has seen revenue growth in the last four years, while the surge of e-commerce volume during the pandemic has had a direct impact on the trajectory. Yeah, we see e-commerce as a very structural and fundamental growth driver for us as a company. What we now saw under the pandemic was a structural acceleration. It uh, took us forward to a point in terms of e-com penetration, which we probably would have reached under normal circumstances in three years' time. So it was a big step forward. DPDHL was well prepared to take this step. The company's strategic plan recognized e-commerce as a growing trend in the logistics landscape but no one could have forecast the speed and breadth of the transformation. But we are now seeing that um, uh, also under the pandemic, um, not only domestic e-commerce has taken um, a faster growth trajectory than anticipated, but also cross-border e-commerce. Um, and we see that very clearly in our express network, but also in our e-com solutions division. What are the other big structural shifts that you see on the horizon? Is it e-commerce B2B? Is it increased trade? as globalization restructures, what are the shifts that you're seeing? The whole B2B e-com is still at a very early stage. Mm. Um, so we believe that there will be a, a huge growth opportunity there. And we also see that when we are talking to our customers now, 
I guess everybody has by now realized that being dependent on just one supplier in one province, in one country, is probably not a good idea. So they want to build more resilience into the supply chain. I think our international um, uh, footprint, our global strengths, is really something we can leverage for the benefit of our customers. Another factor in the company's favor is its balance sheet. Since Melanie Christ became CFO, cash flow has improved significantly. One of my priorities over the last years has been to really focus the whole organization on better cash generation. It's not just a finance job. Yeah? Um, making sure that ultimately revenue converts into EBIT and into cash in the bank account is the responsibility of the whole organization. She says, you know, we, we can't be successful as a company if we are not collecting the cash for our services we have provided. And she has not missed one single opportunity to talk about that. I think it's a very comfortable uh, situation, uh, particularly in the current environment, to have a strong balance sheet. Yeah? I think in that respect I'm very conservative and i rather have a bit more on the balance sheet and a bit more buffer. Spell out for us what the priorities are, the longer term priorities, in terms of putting some of that cash to use mm -hmm. for you. The first priority here is organic growth. We clearly indicated also with our CapEx budget, 12 billion for the next three years, that we will keep investing into organic growth. We are very focused on our regular dividend payment. And then, if there is something left, um, which is fortunately the case at the moment, uh, we will think about inorganic opportunities and we will also think about other means uh, to allow our shareholders to participate. That is why we are currently running a 2 billion euro share buyback program. Inorganic opportunities include M&A, like the recent purchase of beverage shipper Hillebrand. But deploying cash is always subject to careful consideration. Does Melanie ever turn around and say no when you're pushing through or pushing for a particular package of spending? Uh, yes, she does that quite often, you know, because she has... She, you know, she is a person, and that's great if you have a CFO who is risk averse, because you need somebody. You know, the business is always too optimistic. Melanie might be something too pessimistic, but that's a very healthy discussion. And if we then jointly come to the same conclusion after a debate, then we are probably in the right spot. How often do you find yourself saying no to divisional heads? So when I kind of like was promoted into the uh, CFO position, my team gave me a stamp with kind of like rejected. Uh, it sits on my desk. Um, I think the fact that people know it sits there um, already has instilled quite a lot of discipline uh, in, in the organization. Um, so I think um, uh, when uh, I get a proposal, it has also gone already gone through a number of iterations um, and is normally of such a high quality that I don't need the rejected um, a stamp too often. For the time being, Christ should be able to keep that stamp in a drawer. CEO Frank Appel has expressed a commitment to service quality and confidence that customers will accept higher prices that come with it. If you are too expensive, you will be out of business, but if you don't provide the right quality, you will be out of business as well. So we want to be, we will never be the cheapest in town, that's not doable. We are the premium provider, that's our strategy. Of course, it's also more challenging for us when our customers are under pressure. At the same time, I think overall the last two years have shown that uh, a reliable, high quality supply chain comes at a certain price tag. I definitely see that uh, inflation is having a huge impact on the logistics industry and there's been substantial price increases in the last few years. I do not see that changing. There's a lot of innovation uh, happening uh, and I don't see the inflation necessarily going away. It might level out a bit, but it's not going to go away. Logistics companies may have pricing power with customers, but their stock prices haven't been so robust. I think that the issue there is, is the increase in interest rates has made everyone rethink and be concerned about the level of inventory that is out, um, you know, in the system, if you will, and with the level of disruption. I think what's happened more in the last certainly three months is there's more of a view that we're actually now heading into certainly an economic slowdown, maybe a recession. With more than half its revenue coming from Europe, investors may see DPDHL as more exposed to recession risk than its global peers. The company insists it can meet its revenue targets in the event of a downturn. 
it's counting on diversification as a cushion. I'm not so pessimistic that, they are, that there is really a deep recession at our doorstep. So, but even then, you know, our portfolio is very much balanced. You know, we are everywhere in the world. And the world will not go entirely in a recession. I doubt that. Would it be a stretch to suggest that DP, DHL is, to some extent, recession-proof? I wouldn't go as far as to say recession-proof, but I think we are very well positioned to deal with all different types of recession scenarios due to the breadth of the portfolio. The balance of the portfolio really gives us a lot of resilience against any type of headwind. Coming up, a look at DPDHL's investments in action. Melanie Kreis shows me around the company's state-of-the-art logistics hub. What I love about this building is it actually shows um, the big mega trends which formed our strategy 2025. This is Bloomberg. As the chief financial officer of one of the world's largest logistics companies, Melanie Kreis has made her mark in global business. That's not what she originally attended to do. I really wanted to go into research. I wanted to uh, become a physicist, uh, and that was where my passion was. But then during my studies, um, some friends of mine started doing this strange thing. They went into management consulting. I didn't even know how to spell it, and I had no idea what it was about. But what they told me was quite interesting. Um, and um, so I ended up doing an internship with a consulting firm. And I learned more in the two months there than I had in the last two years in uh, my physics uh, job uh, at university. That is how I ended up in consulting. She started her career with three years at McKinsey, then spent four years in private equity with Apex Partners in London, before joining Deutsche Post DHL Group in 2004. I uh, was brought into the company to do international M&A projects. Uh, that was at a time around 20 years ago uh, when we were really um, yeah, building the company in the current uh, shape, acquiring lots of uh, uh, logistics companies around the world. The M&A part was the first thing, and I then wandered into a more mainstream finance uh, uh, field here in, in the group, um, becoming the CFO of our DHL Express division. Uh, so from then on, it was more leading towards the CFO role eventually. Melanie Kreis now heads the finance team with around 11,000 employees. Success in this role is as much an art as a science. If you do the greatest piece of analysis and you see it all and you know it all, but you can't convey that message and you can't convince the rest of the organization that we should move into a certain direction, it's useless. DPDHL is sending a consistent message with its investments. The company spent 123 million euros to upgrade its logistics centre at the Cologne Bonn Airport, designing it around key strategic goals. What I love about this building is it actually shows um, the big mega trends which formed our strategy 2025, which was inaugurated in 2019 when this building opened. So, globalization connecting the world. E-commerce, we have a lot of sortation facilities here for smaller e-commerce shipments. Sustainability, it's a very sustainable building with solar panels on the roof and everything. And digitalization, and well, you can obviously see that it is quite automated. How did the team pitch this investment to you initially? And how hard was it as a sell for them? How quickly did you turn around and say, yes, this is worth the 123 million euros. Of course, you always have to make sure that you have the right capacity for the growth in the network. And at that time, they came and said, hey, we will really see a strong growth in e-commerce volumes on top of the regular B2B growth. We need more sorting capacity. We need this building. And of course, there are always debates. Does it really have to cost 123 million euros and so on? But fortunately, they convinced us because then with COVID and the volume surge, we urgently needed the capacity. At the same time as COVID accelerated demand for logistics services, disruptions in the labour supply hurt productivity. Advances in technology like this digital sorter have helped offset some pressures, but automation also raises questions. Does this tell us that as the business grows, this is going to become a more automated business, that there's going to be less need for labour, for workers? 
Well, you still see people here, and I think what you can nicely uh, uh, witness here is the combination of technology which supports people. So, for example, when you look at the customs area, it used to be a very manual and sometimes confusing process. Now the people are supported in picking the right shipments for customs inspections by light, and they are automatically sorted in this sorter to go to customs inspections. So it is also helping the people um, with the jobs they're doing here every day. We always said, you know, in 2019, 20, you know, we might get one third less jobs in the current setup until 2030 if we digitalize the organization. But we are very sure that our company will be at least 50, maybe 100 percent bigger and we will have more jobs to offer than now. At the beginning of a couple of years ago when we started that journey, people said, oh, you know, I might lose my job. I haven't heard that in the last two years in, as a question in any town hall. This airport hub also showcases DP DHL's aviation fleet, which boasts more than 320 dedicated cargo aircraft. We own the biggest chunk of our aircraft, but we also have short and medium and long-term leases. And with the growth in our business, we anticipate that the uh, uh, fleet will keep growing. You've talked about investing, yes. of course, in, in sustainable fuel. Yes. When does, that, when does that come online? How significant is it? Is it just, the critics might say that's just window dressing around a part of the business that is, of course, very, very carbon intensive, at least yeah. a lot of emissions. Yeah, so the, you're absolutely right. The problem with our beautiful aircraft is the CO2 emissions. And um, when you look at our overall CO2 emissions, two thirds are from aviation. It is about flying these birds with more sustainable fuel. And we said that we are really willing to spend billions on it. Uh, we now really hope that we will see the uptick in supply over the next years. Spending billions isn't vague hyperbole. The company has pledged to put 7 billion euros towards sustainable technologies and fuels by 2030, with a goal of climate neutral logistics by 2050. Sustainability makes good business sense anyway, especially if you are in a business that is um, energy or fuel hungry. There's a compliance element that not just operators in the logistics sector need to consider, but also their customers. So being transparent becomes part of the service about their impact on um, the globe. We had a lengthy discussion. Should we make a financial commitment how much we want to invest for the next decade in our sustainability? And we had a long debate. Is it right to say we want to invest 7 billion until 2030? There were pros and cons. But that was a very intense discussion Melanie and I had where we finally came to the conclusion that this is the right number, this is the right approach. We convinced our colleague and that's the reason why we are where we are, where we are seen as somebody who really commit. There are not that many companies who have quantified their future investment. Still ahead, how one of the business world's most influential women is working to strengthen gender equality within her company. I think the great thing is that now across the board in finance, but also in the group overall, we have role models which show young female talent that everything is possible. This is Bloomberg. Deutsche Post DHL Group CFO Melanie Kreiss is often named to lists of the most powerful women in business. And while men still outnumber women as finance heads of large companies, there are signs that the balance is shifting. The number of female CFOs across major US companies has risen to an all-time high, according to a study by Chris Calder Associates. And executive search firm Cohen Partners reports that 36% of new CFOs hired by notable companies in the first half of 2022 were women. I asked Melanie Kreiss if she's encountered obstacles as a woman rising through the executive ranks. I have to say, um, I have not made many negative experiences. Um, maybe I was also a little bit naive not thinking about these challenges so much. Uh, so, I mean, when I studied physics, uh, there weren't many women, so I was somehow always used to it. And it can also be an advantage when you're kind of like the only uh, girl in the room. Um, uh, I mean, the boss at the end remembers your name and not uh, the 19 guys um, uh, who all kind of like wear dark suits and white shirts and look alike, right? So um, I never experienced it um, as a, yeah, external stress factor. I have to say for me personally, it was more balancing my own um, 
expectations uh, around kind of like getting family and the job combined. Um, but that was probably more of a pressure I put on myself, uh, thinking that I had to be perfect in every dimension and not something where the pressure was put on me from my male colleagues. Hmm. So how do you take that experience and put it to play in terms of how you advance the role of women in this organization? I think the great thing is that now across the board in finance, but also in the group overall, we have role models which show young female talent that everything is possible. In finance, we have a f um, share of women in management of 32%. Um, uh, so we are ahead of the group. Uh, we want to get to 35% by 2025. I think we are now at a position where if we have a vacancy, I want to have at least one woman on the short list mm. because we have enough female talent. Uh, so every uh, short list should contain a woman and then the best person in the race should win. CEO Frank Appel says Christ sets an example for the entire organization and he believes her success may influence the entire industry. She has proven that she is an outstanding CFO and she's definitely a role model in many dimensions that you, you know, what I like about there, she is still, you know, a very warm and nice person and that makes such a big difference. So you can get to that level without compromising on how nice you are as a person. I think she's a great role model and I hope that this has had positive impact for many of us. From the big picture down to the smallest operational details, Melanie Kreis is fully engaged in guiding DPDHL into the future. I wanted to know what she sees when she looks ahead. What do you see as the biggest opportunities for DPDHL over the next 10 years? I think we have a fantastic portfolio um, and uh, we just have to leverage the growth opportunities which are there both on the e-com side um, and also on the traditional B2B side and the key differentiators for us will be digitalization, sustainability and our great people. As you look ahead 10 years, what are some mm. of the challenges, what keeps you up at night as you think about the business going forward? I think we have to keep this focus and the ability to adjust in a very agile way. Sometimes when you kind of like think about um, all the risk controlling and stuff, um, uh, people tend to create the impression that you can pre-plan everything. That's clearly not the case. So I think we have to stay focused and um, uh, keep the ability to react in a very agile way. Um, but looking at what happened over the last 24 months, I'm very optimistic that we will also be able to cope with whatever happens next. And how do you see your role changing in the years ahead? I think it is changing at a very rapid pace, which is a great thing because it never gets boring. Um, those elements I just mentioned for the group overall, digitalization and sustainability are also hugely relevant uh, for the finance role. It's like a new language you have to learn, yeah? and you learn the vocabulary, but then you also have to develop a feeling. If I kind of like put so much capital into this decarbonization measure, I get so much in terms of return out of it. But that's a fascinating mm. opportunity where we can make a huge difference for finance and for the group overall. As you look to the future, Melanie, what do you think are going to be the skill sets, the knowledge bases that are going to be essential to the success of, of future CFOs? I guess probably the two most essential new skills will be to get even better at lifelong learning because we will have to learn so much new stuff every year be it in the digitalization area, be it on sustainability. So this ability also as a 50 year plus old person to keep learning and keep the curiosity, I think that is going to be super essential. And the second element will be being a great team player. The world is complex, you can't know it all. So you really have to work even more strongly with your team. What advice would you give to someone who's just recently been appointed CFO? That's a great question. I think I would probably simply say, be curious and ask as many questions as you can. Try to learn as much as possible, not only in the finance area, but get close to the business. Try to really understand the business because only when you are close to the business and you understand the fundamental profit drivers, will you be a really great CFO. I'm Tom McKenzie. This is Bloomberg.